Um, let's get into uh, w- when the shift happens um, in terms of the way that I guess uh, your argument is the way that um, liberals um, approached um, uh, socioeconomic disparities between races. They, they, there was a uh, there, there was a, a shift in the way that uh, liberals uh, uh, address this. Yeah. So in the post-war era, um, liberals become much less invested in economic inequality. They, they don't give up on it, obviously. Uh, and certainly what happens more to the point is in, in terms of people's perception of, of racial inequities is that in the, during the Cold War, uh, liberals will gravitate less, will move away from political economic understandings of racial inequality and gravitate more and more to what I would call, you know, race reductionist models, but the race reductionist framework is, is pretty broad to constructs that essentially treat race and attitudes as if they are real or inborn. And the matter of treating race as if it's, it's real or inborn um, is complicated insofar as the language that liberals use to, in the post-war era to discuss racial inequality is culturalist. And culture and race aren't supposed to be the same thing, right? Race is supposed race is a social construct. It's not a real biological category. But race is supposed to be a biological category. Culture is just how a population shaped by common experience views the world. And so culture is fluid and dynamic. Race, again, is supposed to be static. Culture, by contrast, is something that anyone can can acquire through exposure and shared experience and just interacting with, over, with other people over time. The culturalist constructs that liberal, liberals tend to use in a post-war era to discuss racial inequality or to make sense of it actually aren't really culture so much in the anthropological sense of the word. Um, they are much closer to what race is supposed to be insofar as people like uh, historian Oscar Hanlon or maybe more importantly, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who I know that a lot of your listeners would, would be familiar with, when they attach themselves to constructs like ethnic pluralism and culture of poverty, the way that they discuss ethnic identities and culture, and ethnic identities are cultural identities, they're not supposed to be you know, biological identities, which is what race is supposed to be, right? So the way that they discuss ethnic group culture and culture of poverty presumes that groups can have norms and and worldviews that may originate in shared shared experience, but that become in, ingrained in them and essentially uh, become the essence of what they are. And the moment you uncouple culture from the material world, you presume again that you could take a population or even individuals outside of its milieu and plop it someplace else and they'll just remain what they were forever. That's not culture. That's that's race. So the constructs that post-war liberals tend to coalesce around to explain inequities really are essentially racialist constructs. There's culture attached to it, which implies fluidity. But when you look at how they think about inequality, it's really a lot more like race. And that allows liberals in the post-war era, like during the Johnson administration, to ignore the culture of poverty specifically, allows liberals to diminish the impact of the structural changes that were taking place on the in the U.S. economy, the very structural changes that were taking place in the U.S. economy that civil rights activists at the March on Washington in 1963 demanded that President Kennedy and then eventually President Johnson pay attention to automation and urban deindustrialization, which were having a disproportionate impact on Blacks. Liberals during the uh, war on poverty tended to diminish the impact of these structural changes on the U.S. economy and in, uh, the tr- structural changes of the U.S. economy, the impact on Blacks, and instead were more disposed to attribute Black poverty to racial discrimination, which was a factor, and there's no question about that, um, but also the cultural deficiencies of the Black poor themselves. And that framework, that culture poverty framework, again, functioned as an escape hatch uh, to ignore the way that deindustrialization and automation 
were having an input, a, a disproportionate impact on blacks. And it's, it is worth stressing that while someone like Daniel Patrick, Daniel Patrick Moynihan is celebrated uh, today, you know, from the 80s to, to, to this very day for having, for his prescience and for seeing the failure of the war on poverty to eliminate black poverty, it's stunning that he is celebrated for his prescience when leftists like A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin, who were the two principal organizers of the 1963 March on Washington, and also put together what was called the Freedom Budget for All. Um, other leftists like Michael Harrington uh, and Charles Killingsworth and a host of others had likewise predicted that the war on poverty's emphasis simply on uh, you know, anti-discrimination policies, which again were very, very important, but insufficient. Right. Uh, and of course, efforts to uh, um, uh, provide cultural tutelage to poor and black, poor blacks, uh, and other poor people. When they predicted that those policies would fail because of deindustrialization, we don't remember that, right? And I, I know that all of your listeners know that we haven't lived in in an economy under an economy in the U.S. that has been an industrial economy um, for decades. At this point, right? We the process of deindustrialization dates back to the 1950s, and yet we don't think about the impact of the disproportionate impact of deindustrialization, the decline of the union movement, as well on blacks and other low-skilled workers. We so, should. Um, so okay, so um, can can you give like some um, a, a tangible um, uh, examples? of those policies and how they were specifically directed at what was uh, ostensibly a, a culture of poverty, which, which you would argue is really sort of more, more racialist, um, uh, you know, in, in service of, of the uh, necessary but insufficient uh, argument that you're making. So um, if you're asking, like you're talking about like during the Johnson administration? Yeah. For example, so like pro programs like Job Corps, which which was not without some value, or community action programs, also not without some value, presumed that the hardcore unemployed lacked not just the hard skill sets uh, to gain access to meaningful gainful employment, but they also lacked the soft skill sets. And so those those programs which again, I don't think we're entirely without value because they do provide um, MDTA, I think would be another, they do provide job training and job training is useful if the jobs are there. Right. The problem was that, that from 1953 or so forward, uh, there was uh, the U.S. experienced a decline in the number of well-paying uh, jobs for low-skilled workers and these would be well-paying unionized jobs for low-skilled workers that had been the pathway that working class whites had taken from the tenements to the suburbs. And so training people for jobs that may or may not exist um, and, and, and don't exist uh, ultimately uh, isn't really the best approach. People like A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin and Charles Killingsworth and, and even W. Willard Wirtz, who was Secretary of Labor, uh, Moynihan was his assistant, uh, they had advocated for public works. I mean, actually doing, taking a page from the book of the New Deal and directly creating jobs for that paid well, of course, for low-skilled workers. The, uh, I mean, and, I, and we should say, I mean, I think that that um, attitude of that there isn't a structural problem, we just have, uh, we, we, you know, we need to we need to have a better education. We need to you know job training is the solution uh, to unemployment. Is I think um, had a lot of durability as an idea, broadly speaking, for society. I mean, I feel like it's been it was discredited a little bit over the past couple of years, frankly. But um, the the so what we had was an issue where they were they were playing around with the inputs. Um, what was really the problem was the function in terms of, of how we got the outputs. It's also created problems in the field of education, right? Because, and I, I read a um, really good manuscript not long ago on this very topic by a political scientist uh, named Daniel Moak. And in the field of education in the 1960s, the Johnson administration, of course, ponies up lots of money to fund 
improvements in education, but why did it do so? It did so in part, and, and, and I want to stress that federal funds for public education is a good thing. I don't, I don't oppose that at all, but the problem with, with the Johnson administration's effort in that regard was that the end game was to treat education as an economic escalator. That is a problem for teachers in the grand scheme of things, because how could education function uh, to that desired end, right? How could primary and secondary education function uh, in such a way that it could offset the transformation of the economy that children are uh, you know, forced to endure and, and, and young adults suffer through uh, and those if those local economies don't have a lot of decent paying jobs. There are profound limits for what educate, with respect to what educators can do. And when educators fail to achieve the impossible dream, and it is an impossible dream uh, to burden education with, with, with ending poverty, who do we blame for enduring poverty? We blame public school teachers as if they're bankrupting America by being remiss in their, their, um, you know, their efforts to make America a fair and equitable society, but they can't, right? And again, we blame public school teachers and this is the backdrop for high stakes testing uh, and the erosion of public education as a citizenship right. And so where do you think we are um, n- today in terms of societies, um, you know, looking at these questions? I mean, on some level, right, we have, I mean, just this week, right, we have uh, incidents like what we saw in Central Park. Uh, we have incidents like what we saw in Minnesota. Uh, um, <clears throat> you know, we have these incidents that probably take place, I mean, uh, undoubtedly take place on a daily basis. It's just that, you know, we happen to have video of it uh, in these two instances. Um, the, 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 the reality of, of racism is, is, is there, but in terms of the way that we look at policy to address not necessarily racism, but racial disparities is, is w- where are we in terms of that, do you think? Well, I think, you know, like every black and brown man I know, uh, the Amy Cooper incident sent a chill up my spine because I've had my own versions of that experience from my teenage years in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, to the workplace as as an adult, and and I think the Amy Cooper incident, uh, you know, makes plain that racism is with us, which is certainly a point that I I make in my book and make everywhere I can, frankly, uh, and that there is a need and there remains a need for anti discrimination policies, which even even as such, anti discrimination policies can't prevent someone like Amy Cooper from doing the despicable thing that she did, um, but they can certainly have some impact on people's experiences in the workplace. They can have an impact on people's experience uh, in schools. They can have an, uh, an impact on people who can afford to buy a home in a given community, uh, whether or not they have access to the home. So we absolutely positively, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, need fair housing legislation, which we have anti-workplace uh, and, and school discrimination, which we have, and I wouldn't have a problem building on that. But if our end game is to mitigate, well, well uh, let me take mitigate out. If our end game is to eliminate, uh, you know, something known as black poverty, I'm not sure how we would do that without eliminating poverty in America for everyone. And there are a lot of reasons that I'm not sure how we would do that. The, the first and most obvious is just math. Blacks are 12.8% of the total population. Um, I don't think there's ever been a time that 12.8% of a population that's comprised disproportionately of working class and poor people has ever won anything in a democracy, uh, right? I mean, it, you have to have some sort of coalition in order to, for, for you know, that's larger than, than that group to win anything. And that's how it's been, obviously, since emancipation. And that's how it will be as long as Blacks aren't 50 plus percent of the, the population. Uh, so if you so so that's our first issue. The other issue though that's worth paying attention to is the limitations of anti-discrimination policy as a vehicle for upward mobility, right? Right. I absolutely have been been a beneficiary of anti-discrimination policy, right? My parents are black middle class professionals. 
who bought their first home, I believe in 1972. So that's about four years after the Civil Rights Act of 1968 made it possible for black people to, to be homeowners. Both my parents were the beneficiaries of affirmative action, which opened economic opportunities for them. And I downstream for them, am a beneficiary of it. But if you look at what, what anti-discrimination policy has done in the absence of a class agenda, Blacks between 1968 and 2016 have actually moved up in, in relative terms uh, with respect to black household income. Black household income in 1968, I want to say was in the you know, 25th per percentile. Uh, by 2016 or 2018, whatever, it was the 35th percentile. Um, so blacks had moved up. Why didn't that eliminate the racial wage gap, right, or the wealth gap? Because the earning power of workers, uh, the bottom 80 or 90 percent of workers, had either remained stagnant or declined. And so blacks moved up, yes, but they moved up uh, in a context of decline for working people. So the real benefits aren't readily apparent, right? The real benefits were that relative increase, and it's a substantial increase. The earning power for, I believe, the, the 35th percentile, where, where Blacks are, at least were before COVID-19, had dropped 30% since 1968. Uh, whites moved up not as far in that context. They moved up from the 55th percentile to the 57th percentile. So they maintained relative advantage over Blacks, but they also continued to experience a decline. If we just focus on disparities then what and, and ending disparities, in this context, that's tantamount to demanding, uh, um, you know, uh, that's tantamount to demanding a higher birth on a sinking ship. Right. Uh, that will certainly stave off drowning, but eventually we're still going to drown. It's a bit of a race to the bottom type of situation. Yes, yes. And we have to stop the race to the bottom, right? Because it's just not enough to move up in a context of, of overall decline. Well, how, I mean, how important is this, um, is the um, relationship between race and capitalism to the argument you're making? Because, it, I mean, it, it seems to me it's, it's basically just, you know, that, 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 that the argument you are making um, is that we're, we have really two, in many respects, two separate problems. Um, and one is um, the disparity may be a function of of racism that exists. You know, I mean, because I mean, presumably uh, that uh, that woman in uh, Central Park, uh, Cooper, it's not just you know if she if she's savvy enough to leverage uh, race in that way. And frankly, um, I, 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 you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, a clinical psychologist. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a clinician, but, but I mean, there's a certain sociopathy involved in that. If she's willing to basically, you know, swat this guy uh, and, and leverage the fact that he's black because she knows that that's going to get the cops to come down and, 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 and terrify him at, you know, at best, maybe um, who knows what she's doing in the workplace. Right. I mean, how many, um, right how many uh, 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 black people she's been able to basically, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, keep from advancing or uh, getting any deals uh, with like a similar tactic. Um, but that ultimately, if we're talking about, you know, sort of broad strokes, that there, there's really has to be two sets of policies that don't even necessarily work in tandem. Well, I, I think at least as far as, black and brown people are concerned, they would work in tandem. Um, I think, you know, the origin of affirmative action was part and parcel of an anti-poverty strategy. And for blacks who were well positioned, let's say like my parents, uh, to move with the transition from a blue collar economy to a white collar economy, affirmative action did quite a bit to uh, mitigate poverty for those black people. It also did, did a fair amount for um, you know, a stratum of working class people, not all of them, but firemen, uh, you know, increased the number of fire, black firemen and, and black cops and detectives and the like in the aftermath. And I'm sure an increase in the number of black carpenters and electricians in, in the wake of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So anti-discrimination policies certainly have 
helped those black people who were well positioned for white collar employment, but they just are not adequate right. for those policies, uh, for those blacks who aren't. And it would be pretty tough for, for someone who comes from, and it happens, and these are exceptional people, but it, it's, it's pretty tough uh, or, or quite a large mountain that we expect poor and working class black people uh, who let's say may come out of households without parents, without parental resources to help them make their way to college, um, not just financially, but also with respect to, um, you know, having the kind of education that they could you know, use to, to help prepare their kids for uh, college. It's to expect poor and working class black people to transition from you know, poor neighborhoods with poor school, poor quality schools uh, to with parents who don't have a lot of formal education to white collar employment. That's not something that white people did, right? That's not something that the, the principal beneficiaries of let's say the National Labor Relations Act did because those, those individuals, many of them did not have, you know, we're talking about the 30s, 40s um, and even 50s, unionized workforce or uni a unionized workforce allowed a white population and a, and a stratum of blacks as well, but allowed a disproportionately large number of whites to transition from, again, the tenements to the suburbs. And what that meant is that those, those people were paid a wage that afforded them comfort and independence. And the benefits of those wages were accrued by their offspring. And they moved to the suburbs in the post-war era and their kids attend good quality schools in an era in which public higher education, the tuition in public higher education was either free or unbelievably cheap. And, and they were able then, their progeny were able to transition into the middle class. There is no mechanism like that for black people today, right? Um, and, and other poor and working class people to, to make that kind of transition today. And what we need is some mechanisms and we can draw from history uh, to, to, you know, for, for a blueprint for this, but we need some mechanism to assist people who don't have a lot of formal education, whatever their race, to earn good wages, wages that would enable them, uh, again, that would afford them some security and stability and prospects for better life for themselves and their offspring. And so this is a very long-winded way to say that I don't see the anti-discrimination policies and class-centered policies that redress inequities as two fully distinct things, at least for those of us who want to end racial disparities, and I'm one of them. Uh, those are comp th those things aren't don't don't exist in worlds apart from each other. They're complementary and they're essential if we want to live in a more just and democratic society. Dr. Torre Reed, the book is Toward Freedom, The Case uh, Against Race Reductionism. Uh, thanks so much for your time today. We'll put a link to that book at majority.fm. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.